you have your uh, Tanya, Steinsal's Tanya, page 95. If you have uh, the lessons in Tanya, you can go back to the beginning of the, of the chapter on uh, chapter 5, page number 870. With regard to this, the rabbi stated in the Medrish, at first, God considered creating the world with the attribute of judgment. He saw that the world would not endure, so he combined it with the attribute of mercy. So before God created the world, already he wanted to create it with judgment, but he saw that the world would not endure. So before creating the world, he already added to this the attribute of mercy. What does this mean? Dr. Rebbe goes on to explain to Hainu, what is the attribute of mercy? His galus elikus, the revelation of godliness, i.e. dei tzadikim, through the righteous people of all generations. The oisais umayushim shabatayra, and the miracles and the signs that are recorded in the Torah. And here again, to take note that al Rebbe adds the words, the miracles in the Torah, recorded in the Torah. What does that mean? Is that only the written Torah? Is that the oral Torah? What are we referring to? What about the tzaddikim of all generations, the Baal Shem Tov, and great mystics throughout history? up to our very generation, the many miracles that the Rebbe performed. Are these also the miracles in the Torah or not? With regard to this, it says in the Zayah, above, on the side of supernal holiness, is the right and there is the left. Referring to the Svira of Chesed on the right and Gvura on the left. Perush, what does that mean? This means that both of these Sefirot, which are kindness and severity, which sounds to be very human, in truth represent divine attributes beyond the comprehension of created beings. Since he and his attributes are one, the world of Atsilus. So now the Alter Rebbe moves on to a new concept. He first began with the concept of creation, that God brought into creation the attribute of mercy, and that is the tzaddikim of all the generations and the miracles that are recorded in the Torah. Now he goes on to say a new concept. And that is one. Page 98. And even Moses, our teacher, may he be rest in peace. Furthermore, Moshe Rabbeinu, our teacher, could not comprehend his prophetic vision. In the world of Atsilus, rather, it had to be translated into the lower world of Bria. The Afghan Zois, even so, furthermore, it was not in the first two attributes which is kindness and severity. But rather, Moshe Rabbeinu's comprehension of his nevuah, of his prophecy, A, was in the world of Bria, the second world. And it was not in the higher midos, in the higher emotions of kindness and severity, but rather it was translated through the lower worlds, with the lower attributes of Netzach and Hoyt. Netzach, which is dominance, and Hoyt, which is splendor, and Yesoid foundation. 
as it's explained in Kabbalah, in the gateway of prophecy. Page 100. Now he goes on to a third concept, which also seems to be totally unrelated. Moshe Rabbeinu comprehended his prophecy through Netzach and Hoyt, and you saw it. But you should know the righteous, after they leave this world, when they pass away, and they go into the Garden of Eden, to Gan Eden, this consists of comprehending the emanation of the life force and the light drawn from these two attributes of Chesed and Gavura. Moshe Rabbeinu, in his prophecy, did not comprehend Chesed and Gavura. But the righteous, when they pass away and they go into paradise, they're able to comprehend these two levels of Chesed and Gavura. Furthermore, and this constitutes the nourishment for the souls of the righteous who engage in Torah study for its own sake in this world. For since from the emanation of these two attributes, a firmament is stretched above the souls in the Garden of Eden. This firmament is called the secret of the Torah. And in this, Uvoi, Said Chof Beis Ois Yesatera, Hanusuna is Hanusuna Mishtei Midasel, and within it lies the secret of the 22 letters comprising the Teda, which is imparted through these two attributes the attributes of Chesed and Gavura. Kidachsira we find pertaining to the Teda, Mimina Eish Aslam, and it says, from his right side, a fiery law was given to them. The right side is chesed, is kindness. The left side is gavura, the severity, which is fire. The right side represents water. The left side represents fire. Torah has a combination of both. Miminoi, the right side, which is water, and ejdas, lomoi, and also fire. As the... Rashi and other commentaries explain that the Torah is white fire over black fire. What does that mean? From this ferment drips do to nourish the souls. The Haini Yudia said, Chabez is a Torah which is the knowledge of the 22 letters of the Torah. Kiyadikiyah Hazeh, who said it as, for this ferment represents the secret knowledge. The Torah and the Torah, he must in Hashem is began Eden. The Torah is a nourishment to the souls in Eden. The mitzvahs and the mitzvahs that we do down in this world is not really rewarded for in paradise. Rather, it's only like garments. Mitzvah in Levushim, Kibuvur, calls Ebezoya, Vayakil, Dafrish Tes, Fresh Yud, Uve Etzachayim, and also in Etzachayim, chapter Memdalit, Beti Gimel, 44, 3. So we have over here three separate concepts. Number one is when God created the world, he created the world through kindness because he saw that if he created the world through Gavura, it would not endure. And what is this? Al Rebbe goes on to explain what does it mean, this mercy? It means that he created Sadiqim and he created the miracles in the Torah. Then he goes on to explain the prophecy of Moshe Rabin that it was even though. It was in a very high world of Atsilus, but yet he couldn't comprehend it there. He had to go to the world of Bria. And even in the world of Bria, it was only understood in the lower realm of 
the attributes, which is netzach and hoi, dominance and splendor. He then brings a third concept. And by the way, the tzaddikim in paradise are able to comprehend chesed and gvura because of this firmament that becomes stretched over them in paradise. Just to digress for a moment and to, to elaborate on this concept here on the bottom of page 101, the Torah is from his right side and a fiery law to them. Implying that there is white fire and there is black fire. A very interesting concept over here that Al-Tareb explains that we understand this through a teacher and a disciple. A teacher is brilliant. A teacher, according to Torah, a real teacher, like Moshe Rabbeinu, a real teacher like, like the Baal Shem Tov, a real teacher like the Rebbe, a real tzaddik who knows all the knowledge of the world, when they give over a teaching to the disciple, so in order for the disciple to understand it, the teacher themselves must take his entire knowledge and create this idea of tzimtzum. What is tzimtzum? It's explained in other places in Chassidus. When God created the world, it's like a teacher who is brilliant and has to create the entire world, give over his entire knowledge in one letter. Can you imagine? Even a simple person like me and you, simple people. If I tell you, take all your knowledge, all the knowledge that you have of 30, 40, 50 years and put it into one letter. What letter would you choose to put all the knowledge into that one letter? It's impossible. And God who's infinite, the infinite God, he created the world with the letter Hey. Ha. Can you imagine what it means to take all your knowledge and put it into one letter Hey? That is what creation is all about. And from the letter A came all the other 22 letters and came about all the different multiplicities of creations. But the idea of teaching Torah is really white fire and black fire. Because for a teacher to give over his knowledge to the disciple, he has all this white fire, all this clarity, but now he has to put it into one little letter which is for him like putting into black fire, becomes dark. So for the teacher, it is, it's a descent, it's a yirida. For the teacher, it's a yirida. For the teacher, it's a descent because he now has to contract all of his knowledge into one letter, into one small thought to give it over to his disciples. So that's the black fire for the teacher. In his mind, he sees the whole Torah. He sees the brilliance. It's light. But for the student, it's the reverse. The student now gets this one letter, gets this little bite-sized baby piece of Torah, and the student is able to eat it and digest it and understand it. He says, wow, this is amazing. This is great stuff. This is so light. It clarifies so many things. And yet, if the student goes one step higher and deeper into the teacher's knowledge, it becomes black fire. He has no idea what it's, what it's about because it's, it's beyond his scope of comprehension. And therefore, this is the hint over here that Torah is white fire and black fire from the right and from the left. It's two aspects of fire, depending if you're the teacher or you're the, or you're the student. So every time you comprehend something new, it becomes light. It's white fire. And the part that you don't grasp, you can't understand, it's beyond your comprehension, is black fire. So this is really the constant struggle and the constant growth that we have every day in knowledge and in Torah, going from white fire to black fire. The black fire becomes now the new white fire, and then the next level becomes the black fire. But the teacher, it's the reverse. The teacher first has the white fire, now has to have tzimtzum, create a contraction, to give over a small piece to the disciple, to understand it. And now both teacher and student become united. So this is a small tidbit 
to understand what it means over here from the right side, there was fire. Again, right is really water, left is fire. But really it's a combination of white fire and black fire. And how much should I give my student, which is kindness? How much do I hold back and not give my student? Because if you give too much, the student understands nothing. The same is with a parent and a child. How much love do I give my child? How much food, how much money, how much toys, how much freedom? Where do I hold back? No more, it's too much, it's bad for you. Too much ice cream, too much candy, too much money. So this is the constant struggle of the right and the left, the white fire and the black fire. But now let's look at this, this chapter as a whole and try to explain it. And also go back a little bit to page 88 and 89, the end of chapter four. The end of chapter four, the Alta Rebbe says that you should know that the letters that give us life and vivify the world are really the kalim, are the vessels. And these vessels come from where? They come from the five levels of Gevura, of severity, Mansa, Pach. And through this, all the other 22 letters are created. And what is the source of this? This is from Atik Yom, ancient days. The word ancient also represents netak. It is severed from the days, implying that it's even above the world of Atsilos. The letters come from a place which is above the world of Atsilos. So there are four basic worlds, Asiya, Yitzira, Bria, Atsilos. Now, these, these letters come from Atik Yoimin, higher than Atsilos. But the question is, we're learning here, Shar Hayichud Vemuna. We're learning Tanya, which is the written law of Hasidus and Kabbalah. It's like learning the Chumish, the Bible, the basic tenets, the basic concepts, the basic story. Up until now, it made a little sense. Now the Alter Rebbe takes us to a whole new level, starts bringing in all these Kabbalistic terms. What's going on over here? We have to understand it on a simple level. Why is he bringing in all this Kabbalah and the history of, of, of creation of the universe and Moshe Rabbeinu's level of prophecy and paradise? What does all of this have to do with the gates of Yichud Vemuna of God's unity and faith? Seemingly, there's no connection between these two ideas. In an amazing talk, the Rebbe gave in the year February 1967, Pasha Mishpatim, the Rebbe gave an elaborate discussion on these two chapters of chapter four and chapter five in Shaykh Vamunda. I will discuss part of it today, and God willing, We'll discuss the rest next week. The Rebbe begins by asking these questions. Number one, if all of creation was created through all of these letters, and these letters come from God, and there are many, many letters, and as we explained, that these 10 utterances of creation, which are created from many letters, have many, many different forms and permutations because they recreate every object in the world by the letters exchanging for other letters and letters having different permutations and different words with different permutations. So there's thousands and thousands and millions of letters. How does this connect with the fact that God is one? It seems that God is not one. It seems to be the opposite of unity. We are now talking about a multiplicity of letters, which is light, which creates all these beings. If so, why are we talking about this in the gateway of unity? Number two, if in truth, 
everything is being created by God. And we explained that it's like the rays of a sun that comes out of the sun. But really, we're in the sun. So when you're in the sun, the rays don't have any identity. It's totally nullified. So if God is everywhere, so we are really nullified to God. We don't really exist. We don't exist. Now, comes along the Tanya and says that there's a concept called Simsu. And Simsu makes believe that we do exist. We feel now that we have our independence. We feel now that we are a separate entity outside of God. We have free choice. We have our own space. But really, in truth, we're nothing. Really, in truth, we rely on God's creating us every moment anew. So in truth, we don't exist. If so, what's the whole purpose of doing a mitzvah? What does a mitzvah mean? That God is in heaven and God is spiritual. And we have a physical world down here, which is material and finite and hedonistic. We now do a mitzvah. We put on tzul. We now give tzedakah. We give charity. We now light the Shabbos candles. And by doing this, we make a bracha. Before we do this, what does a bracha mean? A bracha does not only mean to bless. Bracha means to draw down. So by making a bracha and doing the mitzvah, we are drawing down God's ineffable light into this finite world. That's true if the world was outside of God. That's true if the world is separate from God. That's true if the world is not God. But now that we established in the gates of unity that everything is God, that God creates the world every moment anew, and we are actually in the sun itself, we are one with God. God is not outside of us. He's within us. If that's the case, why does it mean we have to draw down God? What's the whole purpose of doing a mitzvah? We don't need to do a mitzvah. God is everywhere. To do a mitzvah means to reveal God in the world. But God is everywhere. And if we only use our mind's eye, being that we're all intellectuals, the human race is all about being intellectual in contrast to the animals who are totally emotional. So we use our mind and we realize with our mind's eye that in truth, God is creating the world every moment anew. If that's the case, we don't really exist. And if that's the case, God is everywhere. So why do we need to do mitzvahs? So we need it. Thirdly, this is true for the average human being if he uses his mind's eye. But this is absolutely true and more true for a tzaddik, tzaddikim, who are called a makava, they are called God's chariot. Because they totally are nullified to God's will even down here. And especially tzaddikim who come not only from the world of Bria, but they come from the world of Atsilus, Like Moses and the Baal Shem Tov and the Rebbe, who are, who are major, major figures of all the generations. And therefore, they are walking with God and see God and everything that they do throughout the entire day. Why do they need to do mitzvahs? They physically see God everywhere. So to answer these questions that a person now begins to develop when he learns Shara Yichud Vamuna, when he begins to learn the gates of unity, comes along the Altar Rebbe and says, you should know, at the end of chapter four, he tells us that the oisios, that the letters are not light, but the oisios, the letters, the 22 letters are actually kalim, they are vessels. What is he telling us here? What's the novelty here? The novelty here is that now that the letters are kalim, are vessels, we realize that in truth, tzimtzum, is not a figment of our imagination, but symptom is a reality, just like a keli, just like a vessel. It's separate and it is independent of the cereal or the milk or the soup that goes into the bowl or the water that goes into the cup. It's an entity on its own, it's real. 
The same is true that symptom is a reality. It's not like, oh, really God creates the world every moment anew. And really we don't exist. There is a concept called symptom. And symptom is a creation of God. And creation of God means it's like a vessel. And just like a vessel is separate than the light, the same is true. Symptom is a reality. And so we are real. And therefore, because we're real, we understand that we need to do mitzvahs. We understand that we need to make a bracha. We understand that there's a separation between heaven and earth. Comes the question to mind. Beautiful. We just now established that Simpson is a real thing. And therefore we have our own space. And therefore there is a difference between heaven and earth. And spirituality and materialism. And therefore we have to make a bracha. And therefore we have to do a mitzvah. And therefore we have to bring God down into the world. But practically, how is it possible? How is it possible that a keli, a vessel, should actually limit God's light. In other words, you take a white light and you put it through a green filter, it turns green. You okay. take a white light, you put it through a blue filter, it turns blue. Right. Okay. But this is true because both light and the, the vessel, the filter, are both creations. But if we are dealing here with God who is infinite, an infinite light, how could a finite vessel filter and limit God's infinite light? God is infinite. The definition of infinity means that nothing holds it back. Nothing covers over. Furthermore, we say that chesed and gvura, chesed is the light. Gvura is the vessel. Chesed comes first. Gvura comes after. So if chesed, which is kindness, chesed, which is light, precedes gavura, which is severity, and is the source of all the vessels, how could this lower level hold back the higher level? And therefore, to answer this, the al Rebbe gets Kabbalistic. And he says, you should know that these 22 letters come from the five levels of Gavura, which is where, which is Atik Yoimim, is actually higher than the four worlds of Atzilus. And in truth, both Chesed and Gavura are equal. As the Zohar says, there's a right side and a left side. There's a right hand and a left hand, which is bigger. They're both the same. There are lefties and there are righties. And there are righties and there are lefties. Spiritually, the right and the left are equal. And because they're equal, it's possible for Gavura to actually cover over the Chesed because it's coming from the same place. This is the beginning of understanding chapter five, which seemingly at first glance had no connection to the theme of the gates of unity and faith. But now as we begin to unravel and to elaborate on these ideas, we understand that al Rebbe is coming to answer these fundamental questions. That does not allow the reader to continue without having these questions answered. And God willing, next week we will continue to elaborate on the additional details of the prophecy of Moshe Rabbeinu and the letters in the world of Ganeiden, in the world of paradise. I would like to end with a story today. Because today is Yud Kislev. It is the day of redemption of the Mitle Rebbe. Yud Kislev. It's the day that he came out of prison. And as the Rebbe has told us that when a tzaddik, when a, when a, when a Rebbe, which a Rebbe is an acronym, Rosh Bnei Yisrael, which means the head of the Jewish people, comes out of prison. In essence, every Jew is coming out of prison, which means today we have the power to go and unleash our inner powers. Right. And we have the ability to go beyond our limitations. 
And therefore, for some reason, there was an obstacle that held us back from doing what we need to do. Today, we're given the mazel. Today, we are given the, the power. We are given the luck to be able to go beyond that, that limitation. To share a beautiful story with the Mittler Rebbe. A chassid once came to the Rebbe. A chassid once came to his Rebbe, the Mittler Rebbe. Abdoiv Bed, the son of the Alter Rebbe, the son of the author of the Tanya. And it's known that the Mitla Rebbe was called the Rechoivi Sanor, he was called the width and the breadth of a river because he took the teachings of his father, the Alter Rebbe, of the Tanya, and he expounded upon it in tremendous length and depth. So he comes to the Mitla Rebbe, and he tells the Mitla Rebbe, I have a problem. I need your help. I feel that I have a hargosha of Yeshus. I'm afraid, I'm afraid that I have a feeling of arrogance. He didn't say I'm arrogant. I'm afraid that I may have a feeling of arrogance, a fear of arrogance. The Mitla Rebbe thinks for a moment and he says, you know, to combat, a problem to combat an enemy. You have to know who the enemy is. So let me under explain to you what it means that you have a fear of arrogance. You see, when God created the world, he created two forces. He created the force of light and the force of darkness. And he created these two ministers, these two angels. He told the minister of light, your job, is to go and bring light and kindness and goodness and help people and bring the glory of God to the entire world. That's your job. Then he turns to the angel of darkness. He says, your job is to bring hardship to the world, pain and suffering. Your job is to conceal godliness. Your job is to bring doubt into the world. Well, this angel turns to God and says, God, I have a problem here. You know, the other angel, his job is easy. He brings light and kindness and joy. People are gonna like him. Me, no one's gonna buy my story. There's no God, there's, there's darkness, there's pain and suffering. God, I'm never going to be able to do anything here in the world. No one's going to like me. I can't convince anyone. I don't want this job. Says the Mittler Rebbe, God tells the angel, don't worry. You'll change your name. You'll call yourself Nachash Akadmini. You'll call yourself the primordial snake. Wow, primordial. That's a nice name. Primordial snake. Sounds good. Okay. History begins. Adam and Eve are in the garden. And the snake shows up and tells Eve, eat from the fruit. And she eats from the fruit. Wow, fantastic. Somebody's listening to him. He feels great. And Eve sins and she causes Adam to sin. He's doing great. He feels phenomenal. He's doing his job. Now Adam, after the sin, begins to fast. He's fasting for years. And he fasts so much till his teeth be turn black. He does tshuva. Now he does tshuva. He doesn't listen to the snake anymore. The snake doesn't get a hundred feet from Adam Machab. The snake goes back to God. God, look, no one's listening to me. I'm trying. Adam doesn't want to sin. The Chava doesn't want to sin. I told you, I'm worthless. God says, don't worry. I'll change your name. You'll come back as the Malach Hamavis, the angel of death. Don't worry. People are going to fear you. He comes back and he's killing people left and right. Epidemics, pandemics. Wow, he's becoming famous. Till Avram Avinu comes, Abraham comes. He starts teaching the unity of God, monotheism. And the angel of death has no power anymore. No one's listening to him. No one's afraid of him. They're believing in one God. He goes back to Hashem. He goes back to God. Look, God, you see, I told you, I'm worthless. Nobody's afraid of me anymore. I don't get any, any covet, any honor. God says, don't worry. We'll change your name. We'll call you now the Satan. You'll go around and you're going to really confuse the entire world. He comes back as the Satan. 
And now everybody's confused. They don't know what to do, where to go. Okay, he's last. He gets his covet. He gets his honor. He feels prestige. It doesn't last too long. Moshe Rabbeinu shows up. Moshe Rabbeinu gives the Torah to the Jewish people. He teaches the seven Noahide laws to the rest of the world. And now no one's listening to the Satan anymore. Satan comes back to God. God, nobody wants to listen to me. God says, don't worry, we'll change your name. We're going to call you Ayesh. We're going to call you Arrogance. You're going to go into all the yeshivas where they're studying Talmud and Torah. And the more they study, the more knowledge they have, the more arrogant they're going to become. They're going to love you. Don't worry. You go out there and you do your thing. Well, he goes into the yeshivas and he's learning and he's teaching them and they're becoming arrogant and he feels great. Until the Baal Shem Tov shows up and his disciples. He teaches the idea of humility, to be humble before God self-abnegation, all of a sudden, yesh, this yesh has no power anymore. He goes to God and says, God, look, nobody wants to be arrogant anymore. They realize that you are the true yesh, you are the true reality, and everybody's I and everybody's nothing. God says, don't worry. You'll come back to the world and have hagoshas hayesh. You'll have a feeling of arrogance. At that moment, the Mitla Rebbe turned to his disciple and said, look, this feeling of arrogance, don't take it lightly. It's the same one who was arrogant. It's the same one who was the Satan. It's the same one who's the angel of death. It's the same one who's a primordial snake. You have to banish this feeling from your heart with two hands and know that it's evil. It's absolute evil. So today, we have a powerful story of the Mittler Rebbe. We have to know that the evil inclination comes in many forms and shapes. And it disguises itself with many hats and many dresses and many suits. It's very, very smart. It wakes up an hour earlier than us every morning. It goes to bed an hour later every night. And therefore, it's with the learning of Chassidus, the gates of unity and faith, and with the continuity of Torah and mitzvahs, that we have the power to overcome all of these temptations, to overcome all of these negative influences, and very, very soon to see the ultimate unity and faith, when God will rem remove the veil from before our eyes, and we will see how we will see how Torah and Am Yisrael and God are truly one with the coming of Mashiach speedily in our days.